Our dear brethren, we um, are uh, rejoicing in heart for the messages that have been given uh, over this weekend. We are very thankful to have the 2020 vision brought to our minds. Uh, we do uh, think that uh, having the vision of God in the reality that we've been blessed to see, uh, especially at this late day, is uh, especially encouraging and of, of uh, tantamount importance for us to find ways in which we could stay focused on this vision, not only understanding it ever more clearly, uh, but letting it have the intended work of prompting us to zeal, to know the Lord better, to know the Son, our Savior better, and to know the truth more thoroughly and that it might have its sanctifying effect in our hearts and minds in our daily lives that we might show forth the praises to him who's blessed us with this light of understanding as opposed to the darkness that still reigns in the world. So dear brethren, I um, want to continue uh, with this theme of the vision as we've uh, been assigned uh, beautifully from Acts, the 26th chapter, verse 19, the expression from the verse, I was not disobedient unto the heavenly vision. And the setting here is um, uh, the Apostle Paul, uh, actually in the context of both the 25th and 26th chapters of Acts, that Paul had been arrested earlier due to the chief priests and Jewish leaders uh, having been offended by him. Uh, when he had uh, gone to the temple. He was in bonds and imprisoned in Caesarea. When Paul was before the judgment seat, Acts 25, 17, and 18, the Jewish leaders had no credible crimes to charge him for. And I just want to say this sounds so much like what Jesus experienced. Paul, who did not want to go back to Jerusalem, in part because he thought the Lord had wanted him to go to Rome, as had been prophetically expressed to him earlier, that he declared to be heard by Augustus, because he was a Roman citizen, he had that right. And so he was being held in prison until a means of transporting him to Rome could be arranged. In fact, Paul would eventually be transported to Rome, and after being in prison there for a time, he would be martyred by a Roman emperor, Nero, and again, how much like his master he suffered. And let me highlight a few points there. Paul was persecuted and accused by the Jewish religious leaders, so was Jesus. Paul was imprisoned by Romans, so too was Jesus. Uh, Paul was tried several times, being accused by the Jews before the Roman authorities, but with no real crime that the Romans could perceive, and this was true of our master finally killed by Roman authorities for no apparent crime except his faithfulness to the truth, his faithfulness to the vision. And indeed, as Jesus said, uh, for this cause, I've come to this earth. And Paul was being faithful to that vision. The vision that Paul was referring to in his witness before Agrippa and Festus and Bernice was that he had been converted on the way to Damascus from being one who persecuted uh, those who followed uh, Jesus to one who accepted that that vision was meant for him, even as Jesus spake to him especially. And in uh, all that uh, transpired to Paul at that time, in that conversion and shortly thereafter, these were all things that helped give him the vision of what his responsibilities were going to be in the service to his master and to the Lord God Almighty. Not, Paul says, I was not disobedient. And what does that imply? Well, let's think on that for a moment. On one hand, it suggests that Paul felt that he was duty bound to serve that vision. His example was doubly impressive to us because he had been forewarned of what great things he was going to suffer in his service to Jesus. And so he felt uh, uh, the sense of duty uh, that he wouldn't be disobedient to serve the very vision of his conversion and, and everything that that involved and implied. Now, however, you and I might project 
when we read this thought of, uh, and, and, and think of this thought of being, I wasn't disobedient or the sense of being duty bound, we might project how we would think on that. To some, that might mean a certain amount of guilt, guilty feelings for not serving the vision. Yet, guilt has proven to be a very poor motivator. Now, I'm going to stop here for a second and refer to Brother Jerry's previous discourse where he quoted Zig Ziglar about motivation. Uh, you're going to hear a lot about motivation, and I just regret I'm not as uh, um, quick-witted as uh, Zig Ziglar, but hopefully we'll give some scriptural support on this. Guilt is a poor uh, motivator, and we'll talk on that a little bit more later. And you know what the best motivator is. It, it's love, agape love especially. That is the best motivator. Paul wrote in 2 Corinthians 5.14, for the love of Christ constraineth us. And this, we think, is how Paul was interpreting uh, in this mental sense, I was not disobedient to the vision. He loved to serve that vision. And he would do anything, including the cost of his own life, in order to serve it aright. Perfect love casteth out fear. Love is that which remains. Now part of this thought of perfect love casting out fear, Brother Russell in the question book on page 270 defines fear in, in one way as being the result of a mental condition of uncertainty. A mental condition of uncertainty that creates fear. We can understand that. A reasoning mind would like to know what's happening, why something's happening, what's going to happen. However, uh, this is where our faith has to uh, play a large role in being able to satisfy the uncertainty of what we don't know by replacing it with the certainty that God is in control of our lives because we have the certainty that we gave our life to him. And through the various vicissitudes of life, that is the ups and downs of the roller coaster of our lives as events come to us, that faith is going to be called upon when we have to trust him, where we cannot see him. In other words, we have to trust him when we don't see what the Lord's intended lesson is for us. And we've said long ago, and uh, I haven't said it in a long time, and, but let me bring it out here. You and I may be suffering experiences now, today, that might not have an application for another thousand years or 10,000 years from now, if we're faithful, because the Lord knows the end from the beginning. He knows what he's preparing that little flock for. We only see what the scriptures present to us to what's happening on this planet, but we don't know how we might be used in other planets, as Brother Russell suggests. So our uncertainty is replaced with a certainty that God knows what we have need of and is developing that. And that, that's a daily experience for us to work through. Now, if anybody would like, you know, if anybody and if, and if we would like to have a meaningful relationship with someone, we don't want it based on someone feeling guilty or being afraid of us. That's, that's a poor relationship. We want to have a relationship built on trust and confidence, appreciation, love, all those positive things that, that have, a, 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 uh, have the tendency to bond us together, to make us feel as if we are friends. Now, this is in the highest sense. We have, of course, a, our friend in Jesus in the, in, a, in the highest sense, but we have a son-to-father relationship or a daughter-to-father relationship uh, that is the uh, absolute most important to us. And God doesn't want us, our Father doesn't want us to uh, serve him out of just fear, of a dreadful fear. We, he prefers, undoubtedly, to have that fear that is the reverential kind. And it's true, we, we should be concerned, indeed, about disappointing or disobeying any of our Heavenly Father's laws or commands or ways. That's true. That's a proper, healthy kind of guilt if we fail in that, that motivates us to do better and to correct and to go to repentance. But when that guilt then is not relieved by knowing we have sin atonement through Jesus Christ when we repent, then that guilt becomes that kind of burdensome uh, trial that weights us down and inhibits 
our means of having a, a more lovely, literally lovely relationship with our Heavenly Father. And we think that is what he desires us to have. It's, it is better to serve the vision for not wanting to disappoint our Heavenly Father. And that happens at times when our fleshly inclinations are really exerting themselves. And they are hindering our new creature from being able to serve or to worship in the way that we really want to. Uh, you know, it, it's better to serve out of not wanting to disappoint than not at all. But it's still not the best motivation. Um, but it's better to serve the Lord even through tears of the old man, let the old goat weep, as we read in Brother Russell's writings, than it is not to serve the Lord and say, well, I'm not in the right attitude, so my service doesn't count. That's not good either. In fact, it's not as good. Uh, there's an expression in the world, fake it till you make it. And it's better to do a chore out of a sense of duty than not to do it at all. However, we just don't want to be satisfied with that. At times, that's the best we might do in overcoming our flesh. But the new creature is ever wanting. Its will and desire is always to do that, to do the Lord's will out of a deep love and appreciation for what's been done for us. There's another uh, saying that's common, uh, but we really like it. And we think it's even more applicable to our, our spiritual uh, opportunities. And that is, do what you love to do in life and you will never work a day in your life. And that's the attitude we want to accomplish. The man of text from March 24th, which the, uh, uh, the brethren suggested to us, it uh, quotes Hebrews 13, verse 5, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. And Brother Russell's comment is this, why then should we fear what man may do unto us or be distressed in regard to the Lord's work as though Satan or any other evil power could prevail against it? Nevertheless, it is for us to show our devotion, not only by our zeal, but also by our prudence. Therefore, we are to proceed in the Lord's work as though the entire responsibility rested upon us, but in our hearts are to recognize that the entire weight and responsibility rests with the Lord. Long ago, someone said, I am immortal until my work is finished. And we may rely upon it that this is practically true practically true of all engaged in the Lord's service. Precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints." End of quote. And brother and I, I know we've all read that man multiple times over these many years. And the reflecting on this is, it's, it, it really cheers the heart in the sense that it's true. The outcome of any of our efforts really rests with the Lord. We're not responsible for the fruitage it may bear. As we read in 1 Corinthians 3, Paul writes, Apollos uh, planted, Paul watered, but it's God that gives the increase. What are we responsible for? Well, Paul said it well. We're responsible for either planting or watering. Um, we're, engaged in the, we're to be engaged in the Lord's service. Uh, the outcome of what it renders, that's, that's in the Lord's hands. But what a blessing that uh, the Lord is uh, watching over uh, the sentiments we have in our zeal and devotion, but Brother Russell puts in prudence. And, and the prudence, we think, is that balance, that we don't like drive ourselves crazy thinking we have to get certain things accomplished or the Lord's work will fail. Uh, that's taking a little too much on ourselves, Lord. The Lord's work never fails. We might not be the one to finish some part, usually some little part. That may be true. And we might not be able to do, to do it out of uh, circumstances beyond our control. Health, some kind of time, proper other responsibilities. We don't have the talent to accomplish all that we thought we would. It doesn't matter. We just make our effort, but the Lord's work is always accomplished, but in his way, in his time, and with who and which servant he thinks best for that. Another lovely saying, we've got it on our kitchen counter, only one life will soon be passed, only what's done for Christ will last. Uh, we like it short and meaningful. 
So we'd like to thought, focus a little bit more on what motivated the Apostle Paul to be obedient to see what we might learn uh, about that for ourselves. The words motivation, motivational, motivators, uh, all seem to suggest motion. That is moving as opposed to being still. It is suggestive of action and all action starts with the head, the mind, and then moves us to work at accomplishing something. Some brethren have a, some brethren hear a discourse or have a con conversation or a study that to others is uh, very motivational, but to them it comes across as though they're being scolded or lectured. Like I might be coming across that way to some of, uh, some of you right now. It's certainly not our intention, uh, but we uh, present thoughts and other brethren and other sisters present thoughts in conversations and in studies and at, and at times, like I say, it could come across as if we're being scolded. But for each of us, we have to find our own motivation out of what is presented from the Word of God and what we've learned by our observations in life, particularly about ourselves, because that's who we need to motivate. And then if we're successful at all, maybe our example can be useful to others, but maybe not as much as we would like or think, because they are motivated, perhaps, along uh, different lines than what we might ourselves due to personality, due to different experiences, and due to how the Lord might lead them. But nonetheless, it, pays, uh, it is uh, extremely important for each of us to find and determine what are motivational things for us. One might th thought would be is that we all can agree that the new creature needs motivation to put down the old man's resistance to our spiritual efforts in the service of God and Jesus and in our service to the vision. And undoubtedly, Paul had to fight against that too. Secondly, motivation needs to be more than a discourse or lecture. While this can be helpful for most, it's really only just a temporary boost. It's a, uh, we hear something that, that, is, that does motivate us, it's great. We try to remember, we write it down, maybe we listen to it again in, in the future. That, that's all good, uh, but it's only on, the, on that surface level. If it's something very powerful, then we can incorporate it into our, our mental thinking, and then that becomes more regularly useful. But it's not gonna be probably useful for every single one in the same kind of way. Here we go back to the point, it's up to each of us to, to determine in ourselves what we're finding to be motivational. And that takes a lot of thought, it takes a lot of thought. See, another thought, we have numerous motivators in our daily lives along natural lines. Our daily needs and responsibilities motivate us to do all sorts of things. Some of the tasks just aren't very pleasant, but we still do it because we realize that it's a responsibility, something we need, so we have that motivation. However, most often we do not really reflect, reflectively think about what those motivators in our daily life are. So that is also a way to exercise our logic and reasoning abilities to stop and think, why do I do this? Why do I do that? How successful am I at this? How su successful am I at doing these other things? What is really just a chore that I maintain? And what is it that I really enjoy doing? Even if it's difficult, I still enjoy it. Why? What's the reward? And that's the point. We got to find out what the reward. Others have said, and I, but I think it's, it's, it's uh, really true. People do things because there's a payoff to them. Now, don't think of money, even though there's that. Think about more of a mental or emotional payoff. What makes them feel good? What, what releases those endorphins in the mind? What is it that is the reward that they have for doing something that then enhances the power of that becoming a motivating factor in their lives, in our lives. And we wanna turn that, as it were, to our spiritual new creature life. What is it that rewards us in our mind and in our emotions for when we do things in our service to our Lord? Again, if it's just a sense of duty, that's better than not doing it. But we really wanna do it out of love. So let's explore this a little bit more. 
2 Corinthians 16, verse 14, and this is from Weymouth, and we like the way it reads. Paul writes, let all your deeds be done from motives of love. And that's agape. Let all your deeds be done from motive uh, of love. Selfless love, agape. Not expecting or requiring something in return. This is indeed the best motivator, for it does not require the recipient to do anything. Jesus gave us many examples of his agape love in his three and a half year ministry. But one that I, I, I'm just going to touch on was, uh, it's found in Luke 17, verses 12 to 19. I, I, you'll remember this, the event. It was as Jesus was uh, going up to Jerusalem along the way as he passed through Samaria and places. Uh, there were 10 leopards crying out to him that they would be healed, and he healed them. And yet, only one returned, to, as it were, to thank him and give glory to God. And Jesus um, made an interesting comment. He said, the one who returned, we, we read that the one who returned was a Samaritan, and Jesus referred to him as a stranger. So that out of the 10, this one, a stranger, because he was a Samaritan, not a Jew proper, he was the one that actually came back and glorified God and gave thanks. So in this example, what we want to think about for a moment is that Jesus told them when he healed them and they went on their way, he said, go show yourselves to the priests. That's reminiscent of the commandments under the, the Mosaic law, that the lepers should show themselves after a certain period of time on whether or not they were considered recovered or cured from their leprosy to be allowed to move actively among the people in the camp. But these were healed miraculously, not just the beginning of the curing of the leprosy, but they were actually restored to what they were like before they received the leprosy. That's why it was so strange that only the one came back to render uh, praise and uh, uh, glory unto God. However, with that, uh, Jesus was happy to have healed the ten, but it cost him. He gave of his own vitality when he effected these, these healings for people. It was part of his laying down his life daily, part of his pouring out his soul unto death, as prophesied in Isaiah 53. Now, I want to draw from that how, how you and I uh, and the brethren, we, we try to imitate Jesus in this. Now, we can't do the miraculous healing. That's not what uh, we're responsible for now. The gifts have passed since we have our New Testament written. However, uh, we've been in a position over the years to act as sort of a conduit for the brethren's agape sacrifice on behalf of others, primarily brethren, but sometimes other family members, both in the USA, Canada, and overseas, in Europe, Africa, India, um, Sri Lanka and Myanmar and other countries and I know others have too so it's not singular to us by no means I'm not don't want to apply that but in o the over 30 years that we've acted as that little conduit for our brethren's agape sacrifice to others I want to bring out the point almost all of the time not all but almost all of the time the brethren that have given out of their agape sacrifice, they gave it to individuals that they never see, never hear from, and will never meet this side of the veil. But they give cheerfully, willingly, unasked, out of a free will offering because they're motivated to do these deeds out of their agape love. They're not looking for a return. They're doing it because they believe they're the Lord's people and the Lord would have them to do it. This is this reminds me of exactly what Paul was doing when he was taking a collection from the mainly Gentile ecclesias throughout Macedonia and Asia Minor in order to have them send their gift of agape love, their sacrifice, down to the primarily Jewish brethren in Israel who were suffering um, hunger because of the famine that had been in that area. And we read about this um, uh, gift giving, as it were, and Paul's instructions and comments on it in multiple places in Acts 11, 29 and 30, and in uh, Romans 15, 25, uh, 25 through 28, 
And again, 2 Corinthians 8, 12, and 9, and 1 and 2. The point is, when we read in those places, Paul is bringing out that this is their gift out of their zeal. This is something that they are taking as a privilege to manifest their love for God and for Jesus, and that they were making a little return for what God and Jesus had done for them. And they were happy to share. And they were uh, they counted it as, as, as a privilege, and Paul so refers to it as part of their zeal. And in the um, in the Second Corinthians uh, 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 examples, in fact, let me read it to you because it's so nice. I want to do it justice. Second Corinthians, the eighth chapter, and uh, verse eight. I speak not by commandment, but by occasion of the forwardness of others and to prove the sincerity of your love. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, that you through his poverty might be rich. And herein I give my advice, for this is expedient for you who have begun before not only to do, but also to be forward or complete what you had promised a year ago. And, and he goes on. But the example of the brethren giving is following this example of Paul brings out to the brethren there. We're following Jesus' example. We can't give like Jesus gave. He, ha he allowed himself to be emptied of human glory, uh, sorry, heavenly glory, the spirit and nature, in order, order to be found as a human man and to suffer uh, death, even the cruelty of the cross, in order to provide that ransom price, which no one else could do save him. And with that, brethren, we're just finding little ways to try to service that vision and to be obedient unto it. Zeal and sacrifice on behalf of others. Now, how does that gift giving transition into serving the vision? Well, in one hand, it's service to our Heavenly Father by serving his children. It's also the service to Jesus as if it was done unto him. It's service to our brethren, our fellow body members. And at times it's service to the world, as, as Paul wrote in Galatians 6.10, do good unto all men as you have opportunity, but especially to the household of faith. Service is the outward manifestation of our loving motives. Now let me tell you a little story that I think illustrates this agape love for me. So about a little boy by the name of Chad. Chad was in grade school, and he was awkward and did not have any friends in school, but Chad was ever hopeful. As Valentine's Day approached, he asked his mom to help him to provide uh, Valentine's Day cards for everyone in his class. Now, the mom, his mother, was inwardly disheartened by his enthusiasm because she's thinking in her heart of hearts that she could foresee his coming disappointment because he wasn't popular. He probably wouldn't receive a single card for all his act of kindness on giving cards to others. And it, it really hurt her in her heart to, to uh, look forward to that. However, she couldn't gently persuade him out of it. So she helped him prepare each of these Valentine's Day cards for all of his classmates. And on that day, on Valentine's Day, when he went joyfully off to school with all these cards in his bag, uh, mom decided to bake up some of his cookies. So when he came home, he would have uh, something he would look forward to to maybe uh, offset the disappointment of his probably not receiving any cards. But as the school day ended and as she was looking out the window and he was walking home, she saw a number of the other kids walking and talking together and, and uh, all quite happy. But there was Chad, as usual, he was walking all alone and he didn't have anything in his hand. He didn't have any cards, just as she had feared. No one gave him any cards for his, his good efforts to give them. However, as she met him at the door, he came in saying exuberantly, I didn't miss a one, not a one. You see, Chad wasn't concerned about getting a return. Chad loved being able to show how much he cared for them. That was his inward motivation. It was like an example of agape love. 
that didn't need a return. The simplicity of a child, unhindered by the fear of rejection or of being thought less of, the motive was within himself. And brethren, as we mature, we often wonder how many fears that we take on uh, and our fears of being rejected by others or thought less of, being thought of being uh, unsophisticated, uneducated, um, not technically savvy enough, not good with our words. Are any of these kind of fears that are hindering us from expressing these deep motives of agape love? Now, another motive to serve the vision, the joy of setting someone free the joy of setting someone free. In Galatians 5.1, Paul writes, Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty wherewith Christ hath made us free. And in John 8.36, Jesus stated, If the Son, therefore, shall make you free, you shall be free indeed. Whenever you and I share the truth of the vision, we are in fact giving someone the opportunity to be free. Now it's true, they have to accept it at some level, maybe not going on to consecrate, but if they accept part of that vision message of a better coming day, of restitution, of Jesus died for all and all will benefit one day, of God's uh, um, beautiful character uh, exonerated by explaining to them why he's permitted evil, because there is a great opportunity in the future to learn and benefit by having choice and being able to make the right choices in the future. Even if that's all they accept, you and I have set them free from certain fears to that extent. But if they go on and they are moved to consecrate, how free indeed they do become. Now, freedom from sin. Romans 6, 18 to 22. Freedom from errors and superstitions, that there's no burning hellfire for themselves nor for their loved ones. Freedom from the priestcraft or the need of any man to come between themselves and God, for we have one and that's Jesus. Freedom from hopeless guilt. Freedom from not knowing what the answers are to all the important questions of life. Freedom from fears, inward fears and outward fears. Think on what the gospel, which means the good news, think what it means to any and all Christians, uh, people, sorry. Think of what it means to any and all humans. It's always the right answer. Some element of that vision is the right answer for whatever questions or fears someone may be experiencing. Now that doesn't mean that they can always receive it at that time, that's true, because they're still free moral agents and they might not be receptive. They might even cut us off and not want to receive it. How often that truly happens. We have what could set them free, but they're rejecting it at this time because they're blinded. We're trying to free them from the very blindness that's hindering them from receiving it. Someone once said, they don't know what they don't know, but one day they will. And then they'll look back and they'll say, why didn't I receive it then? And the answer will come, it wasn't your time. I hope that every one uh, of us here who are listening uh, to this little talk has had at least one opportunity to show someone the vision or at least some portion of it and that you have seen them being set free. And when you think back at that, just think how beautiful and wonderful you felt. Brother, what a wonderful motive for us to be engaged in the Lord's service. Now, I, I wanna share with you a little example in our home ecclesia here, um, um, Sister Connie Manette, she was set free uh, in a very real sense when she heard the truth. Uh, she was raised a Roman Catholic and when she was eight years old, her father died. And she struggled uh, being taught Roman Catholicism that that something terrible was happening to her, to her father. She didn't know a purgatory or a burning hell or what it may be, but she, she didn't have a hope for him in a, in a resurrection. Now, Brother Dan, her husband, uh, Brother Dan Manette and Sister Connie, they'd already left the Roman Catholic Church by, you know, when, after they married and they searched through some evangelical church, but they didn't find it totally satisfying. 
Uh, they certainly knew Roman Catholicism wasn't satisfying. But along the way, the Lord overruled that Brother Dan heard the Divine Plan program while he was at work, sent down to Fort Worth and received the, the first volume. And as, long as, as well as receiving that, his name was passed on to Brother Doug Melville up here in the Detroit area. And Brother Doug called on Brother Dan on the phone and followed up with him. And they initiated studies uh, with Brother Dan and Sister Connie in their home. And Brother Dan and Sister Connie were receptive to that. At first, they, they weren't quite sure what to make of it because it was out of the ordinary. But as soon as they heard these truths, they were thrilled. And when Sister Connie learned that truth about her father, she was set free, but free from that emotional, mental burden and co of concern out of love for her dear father. And then there will be this time of a reuniting in the future, in a sense, of which is just going to be awesome. So brethren, we can take the joy of setting one free, even in part, as part of our motive. So often when you and I are setting someone free, we don't even know it. Oh yeah, all our witness efforts, whether it's through the internet, whether it's through Google ads, whether it's through um, mobile device witnessing, WhatsApp, uh, tracting, leaving booklets and tracks around, all the various ways that the brethren have had and continue to have and are ever learning more ways to share the vision or part of the vision with people at large, and we just cast our bread upon the water. But brethren, rest assured, whether they move to consecration or not, that's what's up to the Lord. We're just planting and watering. He gives us the increase. But I assure you, we are setting people free from fears at some level. And that is a wonderful motivation. Many of us, indeed, have were enslaved to sin and selfishness, blinded in darkness. Do you remember the feeling of being freed, of coming into the light of present truth, to come to understand that Jesus provided that ransom for us, that we were set free from all that? I do, and I imagine many of you do, if not all of us remember that. Let that be part of our motivation to free others. Philippians 2.16, holding forth the word of life, that I may rejoice in the day of Christ, that I have not run in vain, nor labored in vain. It's a most wonderful thing that God created this opportunity of consecration and a high calling. Now, of course, we know it's to develop a bride for Christ, 144,000, that will be able to work with Jesus ahead in order to assist mankind up that highway of holiness. And, and um, Brother Jerry talked about that very nicely before that. But there's another aspect to this privilege of consecration that I want to suggest to you as, as part of our motivation. And that is God gave us the opportunity to consecrate in part. It's not the main point. We, got, we just touched on the main point. But in part to allow you and me to be able to make a little return for all that he and Jesus has done for us. They've set us free from the slave of, 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 to sin and selfishness, and we willingly enslave ourselves to him and Jesus being bought with a price, and gladly so. We are his slaves now, and we are so happy that we have that relationship because we won't, don't want it any other way. We want to serve him, and what better master could we have? We have a master who died for us to buy us with that price to set us free. In 1 Samuel 12, 24, only fear the Lord and serve him in truth with all your heart for consider how great things he has done for you. And the songs in the night for October 8th on that, Brother Russell uh, writes on it this way, quote, as a help to our flagging zeal, we should continually remind ourselves of the Lord's great blessings to us. As we learn to appreciate the goodness of the Lord, if rightly disposed at all, the influence will be to strengthen us and to make us more and more loyal to him. Failing to seek with our whole heart the Lord's service after we have become his people and entered into covenant relationship with him, receiving of his favors and blessings in this life, and also by promise in the life to come, would mean wickedness which persevered in will surely bring destruction. Faithfulness to God should be the keynote of all our desires. End of quote. Now, when I read that over, I read it 
And I, I focus on the first half of this, but I know there's some of our dear brethren that when they read this, due to their own personality, they read the last part of that. They focus on the wickedness and unfaithfulness. And they find it, uh, it's a negative form. But I focus on the front half of that, and I focus on trying to give thanks and be motivated by recognizing all that the Lord has done, so I want to make a return. While I do recognize that disobedience does, would lead to failure if continued in. So brethren, each of us will have to determine our own personality and how we read what Brother Russell sets forth, and yet what focus or what part do we want to focus on that we could turn that into that positive for ourselves. And what, me, what might be positive for one might not necessarily be positive to the other. I'll give you one it's almost funny example of how it worked out. You almost had to be there. But we were in a class study once, and, and I was happened to be uh, chairing the meeting. And, and uh, I was asking, we were talking about motives. And we were going around the room, and we were asking the brethren, what motivates you to, to want to serve the Lord? And we go around the room, and, and most of the brethren are, are thinking on the positive uh, examples. And that's what they wanted to share, at least. And then we come to this one little old sister. I mean, she's li she was little. She was old, wonderful Italian, such a Petrina Zaker, and very fiery. She came to the truth late in life, again, through the Divine Plan uh, program. But nonetheless, uh, when I came to her, her motivation of serving the Lord was the fear of second death. I was so surprised. I was expecting this dear little sister to, to say something kind of a little bit on the flowery side. But it taught me a lesson. That's why I'm sharing it with you. I can't tell you what motivates you. You probably can't tell me what's motivating me except what maybe I've just said. But each of us need to examine what is motivating us. But I do think uh, our best motivation is that out of our agape love for the Lord and the good things he's done for us. Remember the par parable of uh, the talents in Matthew 25. It was the Lord's servants. He gave some five, some two, some one. And uh, he left. And that showed the Lord leaving at the first advent and, and residing in heaven. And then he was sent back by our Heavenly Father in 1874 to claim his own and to uh, work first with rewarding his servants, the spirit begotten. And uh, the five had invested wisely and, and labored and got a greater reward, the same with the two. But this, it was the uh, man with the single uh, talent that was um, that were highlighted in our Lord's parable. And that man said that uh, he knew that the Lord was a hard taskmaster and he reaped where he hadn't sowed, so he, he just buried his talent. And the master, uh, in reply in this parable, says, uh, you're a slothful servant. Why didn't you who thought I was a harsh taskmaster, reaping where I didn't sow, why didn't you just go and invest it with the bankers at least, so I had gained some interest? I'm paraphrasing. What I want to bring out here is it's true in one sense. Jesus didn't sow amongst the Gentiles, but yet he, on his return, he wants and expects to reap of his uh, future bride class from Gentile believers. It's because the Gentiles weren't invited in until 36 AD with Cornelius and his family when Peter used the second king. But he did expect to, uh, to reap from that. However, he just repeated how this unfaithful servant with the one talent interpreted the Lord, that he was a hard taskmaster. We don't think Jesus is a hard taskmaster. But Jesus, in repeating what the servant thought he was, is basically saying in so many words, if you thought I was a hard taskmaster, at least that should have motivated you to at least invest my, uh, my talent with the bankers to get something on my return. But even the negative motivation didn't work for you. So the lesson, of course, is that we want to have the right motivation, like the five and the two talented ones demonstrated, even if we only have one talent. Fear is not a good motivator. Now, I thought there was an interesting point out of a, um, uh, a uh, Kiplinger retirement newsletter that I read. This is a financial newspaper um, about retirement. And I was glancing it over and it had this article, which you're gonna find a little unusual for a financial paper, and it's, it was developing habits. 
and it's good to develop good habits at any time. And they were focusing on retirement, but they quoted scientific studies that had been done that they found that people who were most successful in creating and here's the point, maintaining a good habit were those who found a way to associate a joyful mental uh, reaction to completing that habit. So if it was a daily habit, let's say they wanted to associate something joyful with that. But they found that the people who only did something out of a sense of duty rarely maintained that habit for very long. So the duty didn't hold them the same way as associating a joyful thought with it. And one of the examples of the habit was dieting, to eat a good diet. The people who ate a good diet for a while out of a sense of duty, knowing it was good for them, didn't stay on that diet long term. Whereas people who associated something joyful with eating that healthy diet, they did maintain that habit and were much more successful. So with us, we want, I'm suggesting, to associate a joyful habit. Maybe it's the knowledge of setting someone free. Maybe it's the knowledge of making a return to the Lord for all he's done for us, that we could actually be engaged in that. Maybe it's in the thought of completing, assisting in completing the bride of Christ so these blessings can go forth to the world of mankind. That, that is what it's waiting for. Philippians 3, 10 through 15, uh, which was uh, shared uh, from the class to us, that I may know him in the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings, be made conformable unto his death, if by any means I might attain unto the resurrection of the dead. Not as though I had already attained, either were already perfect, but follow after that I might apprehend that for which I am also apprehended of Christ Jesus. Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth unto those things which are before, I press toward the mark of the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Let us therefore, as many as be perfect, be thus minded, and if anything you be otherwise minded, God shall reveal even this unto you. Brethren, this fellowship of sufferings and pressing on in this one thing I do uh, in all of this, uh, this is a beautiful experience that if we think about what we endure in sufferings is in a fellowship relationship to our Lord Jesus who suffered so much for us so willingly. Uh, he gave us this example, but he's in our sufferings with us. He shares with us as, as, as we are his body members, as even he said to Paul when he was converted, why persecutest thou me? And he was referring to Paul's persecution of Jesus' body members in the flesh. So when you and I are suffering, it, we're not alone. Uh, we're suffering and our master, our head, is experiencing this with us in, in a certain way. He's uh, sympathetic with us. He knows what we pass through. But he shares in it with us because he's seeing us being developed, if we're rightly exercised, being developed as he was developed, being perfected as a new creature in our character. And so what we take away from this, brethren, is that we want to have this attitude that can then affect our motivation out of love and devotion so that we, in, we can have a sense that in our sufferings, we are fellowshipping with our Lord Jesus, let alone with one another. The brethren suggested, and uh, I'll read the text, it's Psalm 90, verse 12, so teach us to number our days that we may apply our hearts unto wisdom. And it's it, uh, the manna sixth uh, text. Uh, I said that wrong. The manna January 6th text is excellent on that. And again, we read it every year, and we, we do think about it thoughtfully at the time, don't we, brother? Because we're on a pilgrim journey, and we want to reflect on how fleeting these days of the flesh were but grass and how they'll soon be over. But I want to make a connection in, to the current pandemic crisis and how it's affected each of our lives. Some haven't been allowed to work. Some are working from home. Some of us didn't work, but we still are locked down or shut in, some for longer periods of time. But it's, it's really pretty much over the whole world. And what we have found is that initially, when this first happened, 
the brethren were very motivated because it seemed as, is this the end time is in the absolute sense? Uh, that we don't have much time left before the, this old order wraps up. And then we suddenly found, most of us, that even if we worked from home, other activities outside the home were curtailed, so we were forced to have time at home. It's almost like our lives were put on pause in a certain extent. And many of us have often thought, I look forward to retirement, or if I only had more time, or once I get this done, then I'll be free to do uh, serve the Lord or study in the Lord. The Lord did it for us all, all at the same time. Boom, pause. What are you going to do? So brethren, I, am, I have a sense that those of us who, who were already motivated in our services, we took this as just a, a, a great opportunity to be able to just to be ever even more so involved. And others, this came as kind of a shock. And now what decisions are we making as this pandemic, not saying it's going away, but as these lockdowns are eased, at least now, how are we reacting? Are we just drifting back to our old life? Or have we made changes in some way so that we can be ever more greater service or study or devotion so that our new creature benefits from this experience? It's a worldwide experience. Very, very unique as we all recognize. But let's not let it just get, take it for granted or get used to it. What can we capitalize on it for our new creature in being faithful to this vision that we're blessed with? Brethren, there, I'd like to read you this uh, text. It's 1 Peter 2.9. It's from the Diaglot rendering. 1 Peter 2.9. But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for a purpose, that you may declare the perfections of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. Brethren, a people for a purpose. What purpose is that? Well, he tells us on one hand that we may declare the glory of God in his, in his truth by sharing the vision to others who are still in darkness. Part of it is even sharing the vision to those of us who are enjoying the light to be a continued encouragement. Uh, there was an interesting uh, lesson that Brother Alan Springer gave many years ago just on the point about um, setting your uh, little light on a hill and not under a bushel that those who are in the house may see it as well. And he made a distinction that the light on the hill was to be a witness to the world and the light in the house is to be an encouragement to those who are consecrated. I thought that was a lovely lesson. But here, this people for a purpose in sharing this truth. But what is our purpose? You and I learned about this from Paul's writings in Romans 8, verses 19 to 22. Romans 8, 19 to 22. We're there because the whole world is waiting for the revealment of the sons of God, plural. The sons of God, plural. Because the whole creation is groaning and travailing, waiting for that revealment. They have a hope but it's cloudy, it's befuddled because of the blindness that they're experiencing. But they are waiting to be delivered from sin and death into the liberty, that freedom, being set free. And there we see that once the sons of God are complete. That's us, brother. That's, we can be part of the solution and not part of the problem anymore. In one way or another, their brethren, we are given this opportunity to serve the vision that we might glorify our God, give him honor, glorify our Lord Jesus, find ways to be an encouragement one to another, and look forward to the day when all things in heaven and earth will sing to the praises to the Lord God Almighty, and every knee shall bow at the name of Jesus. May the Lord add his blessing.